Manchester City have done it. Alex Inglethorpe and company have come to Old Trafford and have produced a marvellous display. They had their chances too, but before arriving here, they would have settled for a draw. Of that, there is absolutely no doubt. has brought along some of his big guns tonight. Exeter City have assured themselves of a stable future. Disappointment for Paul Tisdale and for Exeter City. So, so close. Decent cross. Logan's touch! Richard Logan has scored the goal! But looks as though it will send Exeter City to Wembley. Seaborn at the back post. Taylor's in there as well. And Edwards. Rob Edwards with just this second goal of the season to confirm Exeter City once again as a football league club. The team loved Adam for the way he played. He was selfless to the need of his teammates, relentless in his running from the first minute to the last, always courageous in the fight. He was the engine to our train. He was simply a true team player. He's been picked out. Socks down to his ankle. Picks out Stansfield. That's the hat trick. And that's what dreams are made of. Jay Stansfield looks up to the sky. He's been lifted up by the Exeter players right below the stagecoach Adam Stansfield stand. The reason he scored three goals. A hat trick for Jay Stansfield. I mean, I just see it almost with a few wobbles along the way, but just a period of growth. And I think one of the main reasons why we've grown is that trust ownership literally is what it says. You know, we own our football club and people have responded to that in myriad ways of volunteering um, uh, in 101 uh, different roles. Um, and that's enabled the club to do things it couldn't have otherwise done. I think the volunteering ethos 
that the trust um, kind of enabled uh, has been one of the the standout things for this club, and it's still going still going on today. We obviously, the trust at the time had 311 members. So actually, for 311 people to claim that they could run the club and own the club um, was a pretty extraordinary kind of thing to do, actually do. Um, going down to um, sign it, we went to Ivor Doble's shop in Sidwell Street. Uh, the trust took a solicitor, the club took a solicitor. Uh, we had uh, a couple of members of the trust who were there and we, it, the signing was over in about 10 minutes. And then of course, we sat down and thought, <laughs> what on earth have we done? We've bought, we, did, we thought about £2 million worth of debt. Uh, ultimately, it turned out to be just over £4.8 million pounds worth of debt. To start with, it was kind of hand to mouth until we had the Manchester United draw uh, in the FA Cup and um, the financial boost that gave us. I don't think anyone really knew, even day to day, how, how, how it was going to emerge. Um, the first job of the trust really was to save the club and then build, build the club um, from a very low point and who, who knew where that journey was going to take us. And almost immediately that we'd done that was that we got uh, pressed about what was going to happen to the club, were we going to fold it, were we going to continue carrying on as Exeter City um, and of course it was a question that we just couldn't answer because we didn't know. I suppose the, you know, the, probably the biggest achievement is that the club's still here today. And if it wasn't for those people, those volunteers then and now, you know, it's not, you know, not just that there, well, there wouldn't be a club. So that's quite an easy answer to, you know, that's the, that's the, the be all and end all and the bottom line. I, well, you know, that's, that, that, I think, I don't, I don't think you can get much bigger than that. You know, we're still here and we were, we were very close to either, very close to liquidation. It, I don't think people realise quite how close it was to effectively being shut down. Without those people, there it wouldn't be here. Of course, everybody's going to immediately point to the Man United highlight, uh, we'll point to the, to the ground, to, to, you know, to looking around this place. Um, there's all sorts, really. I mean, that, the highlights for me were, you know, putting the first game on, you know, be, you know having the meetings beforehand, not knowing, you know, this is May through to sort of, you know, the first game in August literally not being able to pay people, the players up in arms, not being able to bring players in. I, I always think, looking back, that one of the key decisions that was made, and it was quite a brave decision given the finances, was to um, sustain an academy. And boy, that academy has delivered over the years since then. So that was a really important early decision that was taken. What appealed to me about the football club was the the younger players, the academy, the, the history of developing young players, uh, playing uh, young players, being an exciting football team, that appealed to me at the start. And then when I had the interview, you, you start to then do your due diligence and look into the football club and start to learn about supporter own for 20 years and, and what they've done and, and how they've kind of transformed the football club. So yeah, I'd, I kind of done that before getting the job and then getting the job I think the biggest thing for me when you come into a new football club is trying to understand how that football club works, understand the people within the football club and I've been, you know, it's been a fantastic experience for me to, to get to know everyone on the board, on the supporters trust and to work with them to, to bring even more success to the club. The, the player sales from uh, academy players has helped, helped the club financially and so I think that was a a, a really big thing. I think the uh, unleashing of a massive amount of uh, volunteering time and skills has really added to the club's resources and I think with those things together with a, a steady hand on the tiller I think we've just organically grown and grown and then really expanded when, when we've been able to. I mean if you if you look at something like the Cliff Hill I, I, it's just when you, when you compare that ramshackle old pavilion compared to what we've got now, um, transformational.
you are most definitely a great example of uh, of how it can work and you've you've, you've consistently come up with uh, with with high quality people to uh, to do that and to maintain it so it's um, you know it's a real as i say it's a real testament to you guys that um, you've because there is work to do to make the model work but um you know alongside that um, it does need really really talented people i think it's an amazing thing uh, to be connected with the club is a, a really proud moment for me uh, and to you know see what they do, the work behind the scenes, the you know the volunteers that we have at the club and what everyone does is, is remarkable to, to make the club such a success. Over that time there's been massive, massive pluses and of course I could name any number of games that were huge. Every, every club is, is different in some ways and every trust owned club is different, has a different history, has a different uh, structure, um, but I think I think the positive things that it gives you is, is, is just a, a sense of connection and and a sense of democracy uh, in the football club that that leads to a lot of people feeling something extra. I mean, everyone supports their football club, whatever the ownership model. But I think at Exeter, you get something extra. Um, and, and that, that, that's worth a lot. I think we're looked at from the outside with a, a degree of envy. I think the government is very, very interested in what we're doing because, I don't want to be holier than now, because you know, we have a lot of, still a long, long, long way to go. You know, we've achieved a massive amount. I suppose we've, we've swum the Atlantic, all we've got to do now is to climb the mountain. But um, you know, there's, it, it's a, from the outside, people looking in, you know, see it as, as very virtuous, and I believe that is the case, and it's probably why I'm still involved. You know, I think despite all the challenges, we've navigated our way really cleverly through, through, um, and and you know, we, we can be really proud at the moment of being you know the the leading fan-owned club in terms of our position in the in the football pyramid. I think it creates uh, real positivity and a real alignment from the terraces to, to the pitch uh, via via the board so to speak so for me SGP is one of the best environments I've ever seen to, to play football and and to be uh, to be yourself to, to go and express yourself and play a really attacking uh, brand of football and and I say that to players all the t I say that to the players at the club but I also say it to players that we're trying to bring in. I really genuinely believe it's an amazing environment to, to play football and I think that's because the supporters feel really connected to the football club. They feel like they have a say in what happens at this football club and they feel like they are part of the journey and part of the success and that brings a real togetherness on a match day at SGP. And even you speak to the sponsors and the people that support us, so from the volunteers to the sponsors to the staff, they all like being a part of it. I mean, it's got its shortfalls and it's got its challenges, but nonetheless, underneath the strength of it is huge. I think, and uh, you know, many of the sponsors are their Exeter people or Greater Exeter, and they want to help their club. You know, they see it, as, and, and it is theirs. You know, there's no—I'll use the proverbial phrase: no mill owner here. There's nobody that's you know got a, any charge over it as such, and it and it and it's um, vibrant and it's also. Uh, you know, in, in good financial position. So, you know, the club has many virtues actually. Lots of challenges, but many virtues. I would say the club's community ethos has meant that the club has grown. Uh, the community of Exeter, the community of Devon uh, and across the country. It's also helped us with our community activities as well. We share uh, a, a community ethos um, and we've gone from being an organisation and a charity that delivers football activities for children uh, which we still do, but now we deliver a whole lot more uh, and which encompasses the, the whole community. And I think that that is something that, that the Trust is, is, is an organisation that does as well. There is a, a peculiar belief amongst people in Exeter that they can, that they can do these things. And I, I, it, it, it's so difficult to explain, it's an intangible. But somehow people have actually come to believe that being trust owned and trust run is probably the best way to actually run Exeter City. They didn't believe that in 2003, but I think most people have come to think, actually, this is quite a good way to run a football club. And if you compare it with involvement in the community, you only have to go and talk to Jamie or, or people like that about what's happened. 
and, and you realise that in fact, you know, Exeter City up until 2003 was 90 minutes of football on a Saturday. And it's, it's now, you go around the city and it's everywhere. Look behind you and see where you've come from. Look what's been achieved and it's quite phenomenal what's been achieved when you put that into context. But at the same token, you know, look in front, mm. there's some, you know, some mountains still to climb, um, but we've done it before and I think we can do it again. When you compare then with now, I think everyone that's been involved and an awful lot of people have been involved, I think it's time to, you know, just take a moment and say, well done everyone, that, that, that you, you've created something wonderful.